Valve confirms they're doing the thing we want them to do. Disney decides, hey, if you die, I hope you had a Disney Plus subscription and AMD is fixing the Ryzen 9000 issues. Let's get into the hot news, everybody. I'm your Brett host. We're gonna be going over the hottest tech news I can find on the internet while you enjoy your breakfast this Thursday, August 15, 2024. I just wanna start off with an apology from yesterday's episode. Uh, we were out of focus because I, as things are changing, just because of the moving around that I've been doing, I've been trying to produce some content and that has led to me using a camera I'm unfamiliar with in ways that I'm not typically uh, doing. So I forgot to put the autofocus back on. That's, that's the problem. And I really hope that Valve doesn't forget about the fact that everybody wants SteamOS on a bunch of different handhelds. We talked about in a recent episode that they're actually doing that. They have extra RG Ally keys that they put into a SteamOS patch recently. But one of the things that got confirmed when discussing this with a Valve employee was that uh, the team is continuing to work on adding support for additional handhelds on SteamOS. It's confirmed. It's a real thing. It's something that they're moving forward on that I think we all absolutely want. And you know what I want, and I wasn't aware of it until I got it. Today's video is sponsored. Today's video is sponsored by Taurus and their O-Stand Spin Case and Mini Mag Power Bank. The Taurus O-Stand Spin is a slim yet functional phone case, allowing you to feel the natural shape of your phone while still knowing it's secure. Keeping my phone from being big and clunky is something that I look for in a case and Taurus has nailed the sleek and slim design that I prefer. The case itself has a clear matte finish on the back to show off your phone's color and a soft touch rubber on the sides to protect from drops up to 12 feet. The rubber sides also feature a one 1.5 millimeter raised edge to keep your screen safe and a 2.5 millimeter edge for your camera bump. And while I kept it classic with the see-through for my iPhone 15 Pro Max here, Taurus offers several different colors to either match the finish of your phone or add a pop of color. The main feature of the O-Stand Spin is the 360 degree rotatable magnetic stand built into the case. Fun fact, Taurus was actually the original brand to create phone cases with this ring style stand. You simply pop the ring out to use it as a finger loop while holding your phone or use it as a kickstand when you want to relax with a YouTube video or need to follow along with a recipe in the kitchen. Supported by an array of 32 magnets, the rotatable ring has smooth movement and a strong hold on all of your MagSafe compatible accessories. A great example of a MagSafe accessory to pair with the case is the Taurus Mini Mag Power Bank. With this card sized power bank, charging is made simple with just a snap and go. Being just 0.3 inches thick and weighing only 4 ounces, this tiny charger packs the power to to fully charge your phone in just two hours, capable of 7.5 watt wireless and 18 watt wired charging. Pressing the power button twice will activate trickle charging mode, designed specifically for wireless earbuds. Taurus offers great battery longevity inside the bank with guaranteeing 500 cycles before any aging. Taurus has put together a great combo with their O-Stand spin case and their Mini Mag power bank. Rest easy during travel knowing your phone is secure and just one snap away from a portable wireless charger. You can check out these two products via the link in the description down below. Huge thank you to Taurus for sponsoring today's video and giving me a really nice case to take on vacation. It'd be pretty cool to have like one of those Taurus spinning rings for a handheld, not just a not just a phone. That way I could have like a built-in kickstand, but maybe somehow do like MagSafe charging, then it could be neat. And what's also neat for Windows handhelds is Microsoft coming out and announcing that they are redesigning the Xbox game bar a little bit to make it more compact for gaming handhelds in case the thing that was stopping you was not the rest of the operating system, but simply um, the Xbox game bar being too clunky and chunky. Now it's now it's less so. Speaking of clunky and chunky, Intel's been de-chunkifying their business, trying to make sure that they correct the ship, especially with the massive stock losses that they've been taking, on top of the fact that they've been announcing that their revenue is down, their IFS investments are up, their costs are incredible, and it's been reported that they have sold off their entire stake of ARM investment. They had roughly $150 million in ARM stock, ARM being a competitor to Intel. They no longer hold that, divesting in order to potentially have some cash on hand, especially since they have roughly $32 billion in liabilities, but only $11.29 billion in cash and cash equivalents on hand. They're trying to make sure that they're short up to make sure that they're ready for the long haul with all of that. And if you've been on iOS, on iPhones, you've been in it for the long haul, getting features that have been standard on Android for a long time. And the latest one that's coming out is that you can use your NFC kind of the way you want. It's not just gonna be limited to Apple Pay anymore 
anymore. Apple's opening up tap to pay so that you can use other apps, not just things you have stored in Apple Pay by double clicking the power button to make that happen. There are certain things that the developers have to adhere to in order for this to be supported, but it is more open as of iOS 18.1. Look at you, Apple people, me. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. You needed this. Your future's brighter now, which mine is with Reese giving us the deals. I'm excited to see how he's gonna save you money today. All right, Reese, let me tell you about the worst deal of all time. I hope you haven't heard of this yet, Reese, because I want to break the news to you. You specifically, if you're watching this episode of Hot News, Reese, I need you to con comment Disney Plus down below in the comments, okay? Reese and Reese only. If you're not Reese, keep scrolling. Anyways, turns out that there was a death that happened at a Disney Springs restaurant recently. A man's wife died due to an allergic reaction because the restaurant did adhere to the accommodation of people with allergies, despite them saying that it was a top priority. It's a tragedy. This would be horrible to happen to anybody. And so the person who had this happen is suing Disney for damages of more than $50,000. This got filed, but Disney has come out and said that, well, actually you can't sue us in a court of law because you signed up for Disney plus in 2019, you have agreed to force arbitration with us. So despite the fact that this happened at a Disney Springs restaurant, which has no terms of service for you to enter, and you're not actually agreeing to any sort of forced arbitration. You did that with our company half a decade ago when you signed up for our new streaming service. And additionally, even if that's not good enough, you also did it for the My Disney Experience terms and the conditions when you went to Epcot in September 2023. So you're not allowed to actually sue us. To which the lawyers for the person who lost his wife and is trying to at least seek some damages for negligence that is happening here is the lawyers are essentially saying that this is preposterous, it's absurd. The fact that you have a Disney Plus account shouldn't mean that you can't sue Disney for bad things just because one thing happened at a park and it's not like the Disney Plus app actually mismade her meal. This is a wild thing, this is a true story. I wish this was fake. This is an absurd thing, but if Disney is really trying to protect themselves by going to force arbitration clauses that happened in a 2019 agreement to a streaming service that likely was never actually displayed and also one of the things being argued is that even if these things are like converging behind the scenes the the person who is agreeing to this has no idea that one goes with the other Ag agreeing to certain terms and conditions at epcot shouldn't automatically tie them to their disney plus account and there's no way for that person to have been informed of the fact that both of those are being agreed upon together and also you didn't sign a terms and conditions in order to enter the restaurant that ended up killing his wife. This is hard in a lot of different ways. I'm curious to see how it plays out. This has been big across the internet lately, and I'm, I'm curious to see how it all resolves. I hope justice is, is handled. And now to shift gears on something that matters a significant amount less than losing your significant other is the Ryzen 9000 reviews. The 9950X and 9900X got reviewed yesterday, and it has been a whirlwind, a tornado of uncertainty. Uh, again, Video Cards always does a great roundup where you can check out all of the different chips that have been reviewed by different websites, whether that's gonna be video or written, but it's just been convoluted. I've seen a lot of people indicating that 9950X, 9900X, they kind of suck. They're not actually as good as the previous generation in a lot of ways. But then you also have certain benchmarks like this, where the 9950X destroys the 7950X 3D and things like Minecraft. But then you have other things like this, where the core to core latencies are two and a half times higher on the 9950X versus the 7950X. Or you have people like one us miss discussing the fact that the integrated memory controller has actually not been updated on Zen 5, despite the fact that it's supposed to be a ground up build. And this is something that's just kind of underwhelming altogether. There's a lot of different reasons why the 9000 series just appears to be something that a lot of people do not like. The 7000 series was a little weird because it required a whole system overhaul and people didn't really want to jump onto that right away, even if the performance of something like the 7600X was actually fairly good. The 9000 series appears to just be 
pushing people off altogether. We talked about this in yesterday's episode of Hot News. According to certain sales metrics, it doesn't look like the 97 or 9600X have sold particularly well. But I'm curious, are you picking up a 9900 or 9950X today? I probably will be buying both of them as soon as they go up for sale. I'm curious to know what are you going to be doing. But in case you're looking at the Ryzen 7 and Ryzen 5 versions of these CPUs, there's hope for them, a report coming out saying that AMD is actually gonna patch and make it so that you can download more TDP for these CPUs. One of the things that's been coming out is that they just appear to be nerfed. If you turn PBO on for the 9700X and the 9600X, you're getting significantly faster FPS than you otherwise would. But now it's being reported that the 97 and 9600X will get a BIOS update that will give you a 105 watt TDP, which brings it directly in line with what the previous generation was, but should likely allow you to immediately see that performance difference. And it can make it so that you could just have the 65 watt TDP option as an eco mode for anybody who wants that Ryzen 7000 level performance at significantly better wattage, or you could just have the full power mode and make it easy. Hopefully AMD could come up with a piece of software that allows you to switch between the two easily in Windows. That'd be that'd be swell. Who they're, they're always really good at doing that. But this is good news. AMD appears to be trying to fix some of this. Uh, having the 9700X at 65 watt TDP versus 105 watt, I don't think was gonna sway a lot of people. The reviews do show off how efficient Zen 5 is. Maybe that's what AMD was going for. They just wanted the reviews to highlight how efficient it was, but then they, when it actually comes to major sales time, they're just, uh, they're just gonna ship it with a high TDP and not care about the efficiency whatsoever. I do know from our time with Zen 5 on the mobile form factor, especially compared to something like the Ally X, which has the 7 an 80M GPU in it. The 880M is fantastic. The things that AMD has done on Zen 5 and Zen 5C cores, as well as the Strix Point APU, they're very efficient. They're very good at low TDPs. They perform quite nicely, but it doesn't appear like it scales super high or easily and uh, on the desktop level. But um, is my brain gonna scale to your comments? I don't know what that means, but you're just gonna have to roll with the punches with me. We got Next Evolution saying, AM4 lives forever. In about 10 years, there will be a massive amount of working AM4 CPUs looking for still functioning AM4 motherboards. I didn't think about that. The graveyard. Mm. Cam saying, ooh, what if the Pixel 9 had AI sharpening for YouTube videos? I, I'm sorry, all right? Man, when I'm not in the studio, I things are a little bit more difficult. I'm sorry, everybody. With Work Warbly saying, so this is how I normally see you when I watch you on the actual television without glasses. This brings me back to the day's public cable access. I'm sorry, I was out of focus. And then Ryosu saying, all of the Zen 5 reviews are completely all over the place. Same tests on different channels have different results. I would wait at least a few months when we get more GSA BIOS updates. I think that's I think that's exactly where the mainstream is headed, especially X3D chips likely to uh, be the thing that people are waiting for more than the BIOS updates. They just want to see Ryzen 9000 have a little bit more time cooking. But the next comment's got to be my favorite. I'm so confused with all this talk about AMD's parkours and cache. See you back here for more of the Haas Tech News tomorrow, my friends.